the great Australian dream has been about home ownership, it's now become a lot of people's nightmare. The last Zoom auction we were on, we had 28 people registered to bid and it went nearly a million dollars over the guide. At the start of the COVID outbreak, economists warned house prices could fall by 10 to 30 per cent. How wrong they were. Is there any better bid? Do we go again? I think that buyers have seized on the opportunity in lockdown to pounce and to purchase right now. Twice now. We thought it would stop for a pandemic, but it hasn't. We are selling. And I think it's gone against all of the experts and predictors out there. It just keeps going. What was asking the price on that again? 1.38. Office over. Okay. Properties in Tasmania are literally selling within around about 48 hours. I'd say that for every property that we sell, we could probably sell it 10 times over. This year, house prices have risen at the highest rate in at least three decades. When you have a rapid rise in house prices, it widens the gap between those who have property and those who don't have property. Sometimes people go through and they actually say, like, oh, this is going to be my fourth investment property. And it's, it's, it's hard. It's pretty gut-wrenching. $9 trillion is now sunk into Australian homes, three times the entire pool of money in superannuation. Housing has become the great divide between the young and the old, the well-off and the less so. For my generation, it means a lot less home ownership. I feel it's very unfair. I'm surprised there isn't more anger among younger people about the way in which the housing market has been rigged against them and their life chances by their parents' generation. The situation's left me feeling completely defeated. I did everything right. I did everything that every politician has ever told us to do. And it goes, we sell, we sell. Welcome home, we are sold to your $1,300,000. Tonight on Four Corners, the extraordinary cost of home ownership in Australia. We take the pulse of prices and hear from people frozen out of the market as we investigate what's causing the housing affordability crisis. Good afternoon, how are you going? Good, thank you. I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for taking the time to book in the inspection. I'll uh, give you a little bit of a tour. Welcome to real estate, COVID lockdown style. So this is 7 Eulabar Avenue in Elwood. Yep. It's a three bedroom, double fronted bungalow. It was built in the 1940s. It's in a nice little cul-de-sac street. It's got a... Agent Adrian Savalas is showing a prospective buyer through this bungalow at Elwood. It is nice, I like it about 15 kilometres from the CBD in Sydney's inner southwest. There's a shortage of stock at the moment, so buyers are forced to compete a little bit harder due to less opportunity. The average number of bidders at our auctions has increased from five to 10 since going into lockdown. Um, and the number of properties that we're carrying on the market is about 50%. Earlwood is classic middle-class suburbia, for decades seen as the domain of your average family. Earlwood is a nice middle-class electorate, not quite the bluest of the blue, but nonetheless held comfortably by the Liberals for the last 28 years. It's the suburb where former Prime Minister John Howard grew up. Now, if you own a house here outright, at least on paper, you're almost certainly a millionaire. Across Earlwood, a typical house value has gone up about 66% since mid-2019. So you're talking about a median house value that's gone from about 1.1 million to 1.8 million. Thank you so much for joining us in this brave new world of digital auctions online on Zoom this evening. Our offering tonight is the personification of the Australian dream, isn't it? It's a home that retains charm and character of its era. It's soaring ceilings, ornate cornices, dark timber boards, but it's seamlessly... On auction day, the agents are working prospective buyers and bidding for one on the phone. 
1.135, Clarence. Okay, let's start it away there at a million three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's cheap, but cheap should be easy. Meaning easy buying at that level, I would have thought. Hello, number two. One and a half. Bidding climbs to 1.5 million, more than double what it sold for 10 years ago, but it's not enough. We understand, big decisions for our vendors, big decisions for our buyers. Surely you don't let it go for that. Chips are down. Ownership beckons. Clarence, we're selling. There you go, the magic words. Once, twice, third, last chance. Is there any better bid? We let it go, we sell it through at $1,710,000. It is sold. Congratulations. Well born. Uh, bit of number six. Adrian will be on the phone to you very shortly. Go back a year. Would you have imagined that a bungalow like this in this suburb would be selling for more than 1.7 million? No, definitely not. If rewind 12 months ago, um, I'd say this would probably be a 1.2, 1.3 million dollar house by way of um, the way it's configured. Um, you know, we thought when we took on the job, we thought 1.5, maybe 1.6, and that was consistent with our feedback throughout the campaign. Across the nation, house prices have skyrocketed. Australia-wide housing values have gone up 20% over the past 12 months, and that's the strongest annual growth rate we've seen in about 31 years. In June, the Australian Bureau of Statistics put the price of the average Australian dwelling, apartments and houses combined, at $836,000. In the cities, it's even higher. On our numbers, it's actually just a little bit north of a million dollars now. It's a huge amount of money. <laughs> it, it is uh, a significant amount. I never would have thought I'd see that in my career as, as effectively being in the average across the capital cities. For a majority of Australians, the property market has been an escalator to ever greater levels of personal wealth. And if you've been able to get on that escalator at the bottom, you've done exceptionally well over the following 30 years. If you've been able to hop onto it at different points during that period, you've also shared in those gains. But if you're part of an increasing minority of Australians who haven't been able to get the first foot on that escalator, you've missed out. We have created some of the least affordable housing in the world. That isn't just a failure, that is equivalent to intergenerational theft. Since the early 1990s, house prices have risen about 550%. Home ownership's now fallen to its lowest level since the mid-1950s. What's really striking is the decline in the home ownership rate among people under the age of 45, which at the 2016 census was lower than it had been at the census of 1954. And I suspect when the 2021 results come out that the home ownership rate among younger Australian adults, that is, say, between their 20s and mid-30s, will be lower than it was at the census of 1947. And the affordability problem has spread beyond the biggest cities. Housing in Hobart used to be cheap, no longer. It now costs more to buy an average priced house in Hobart, population 220,000, than it does in Adelaide, Brisbane or Perth, which are cities that have between five and ten times as many people as Hobart does. But at the same time, average wages in Tasmania are about 15% below those on the mainland. So uh, the difficulty that people face in getting into housing in Tasmania has deteriorated quite dramatically. It's a picture postcard Hobart home. Buyers agent Kafka Dornham Tassel is house hunting on behalf of interstate buyers who want to move here. Her boss, Jasmine Rankin, is stuck in Melbourne amid the COVID lockdown.
Hello. Hey, Carly. Good. How are you? Good. How'd you go? Good. Yeah, it's a really good example of a 1900s Federation home, um, yep. 200 square metres. But the front portion of the home um, is currently occupied as an Airbnb and grossing about 50k per annum okay. in additional income. Mainlanders and expat buyers have been fueling a frenzied market. Oh, I've never seen anything like it. It's ridiculous. Most of the time, properties are listed on a Thursday or a Friday, and it's not uncommon for them to be under contract before the weekend's open home has even been conducted. The competition is fierce, and yeah, it's 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 crazy out there. To compete, buyers are throwing caution to the wind. People are buying properties sight unseen from another state. People are waiving their rights to finance, even though they, they clearly require financial approval in order to be able to proceed. They're, you know, they're not doing um, building inspections, just basic checks and balances. People don't have the time to, to conduct. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of people are taking a lot of risk. Properties in Tasmania are literally selling within around about 48 hours. I'd say that for every property that we sell, we could probably sell it 10 times over, and I'm not exaggerating. The demand is through the roof and, and people are just paying well over the odds in order to secure a piece of Tasmanian real estate. About 20 k's from Hobart is this renovator's delight. A potential first home for a young couple. Hang on, grab your brochure. I'll just grab your contact details. Yes. Have a wander through. So this one's been advertised for the first time in 45 years, or just yep. over 45 years. Definitely with a renovation, I could see ourselves hmm. living here. It's, uh, it's a nice place. So the location's yeah, the further out of town you go, the bigger you can get, obviously. And this one's about as big as we can get for our price range. Thank cool, you. thank you. Thanks. Jonathan and Ella have been looking for more than a year. Like many of their generation, they're employed on short-term contracts, which made it hard to get approval for a loan. Yeah, it's stressful because you don't know what's going to happen in a year's time, whether you're still going to have a job and um, whether you'll still be able to pay your mortgage or pay your rent. But we're afraid that if we wait another year, when we might have more stable income, we won't be able to afford anything. Renovate the kitchen and the bathroom a little bit. The only way they've been able to save a deposit is by living with Ella's dad, because rents in Hobart are sky high. All my friends have done the same thing. They lived with their parents or their in-laws and then went from their parents' place to buying a house. I don't know anyone that has rented. Another open home. And this house looks like it could be the one. Yeah, I really like it. It's a really nice view, really nice street. Offers over 419 for this house. Yeah, and our limit is 500,000, so I think we can put in a competitive offer for this place. So hopefully we can get it. Yeah, I think we're in with a good shot if we put an offer on this place. Jonathan and Ella offer $46,000 over the asking price and miss out. I think it's pretty dire if, like, Jonathan has a PhD and I have a master's and we can't break into the market. Like, I feel bad for people, like, you know, single parents. Like, I don't know how they're meant to get into the market if we can't. I've often said over the last 15 years that I'm surprised there isn't more anger among younger people about the way in which the housing market has been rigged against them and their life chances by their parents' generation. But it would seem that instead of taking to the streets and demanding change in Australia's housing system. Australia's younger adults are taking out their revenge on their parents' generation by refusing to move out of their homes. 
I'm the intake coordinator and educator for a small mental health hospital here in Tassie. And I'm also a carer for my mother when I'm not at work. I don't have a bank of mum and dad. My mother was disabled since I was a child. When I first came into nursing, you know, everyone was like, oh, you know, now you're a nurse, you'll be able to save a deposit, get a house. And in my suburb, houses at the time were going for $200,000. So a 5% deposit was nothing. And then the, those prices have doubled in the past eight years easily. Um, so now it's just, unless I suddenly produce, you know, thousands of dollars out of nowhere, it's, it's probably never gonna happen. Ashley lives with her mother in social housing. She yearns to buy a home for them both. Owning a house would mean the world, the absolute world to me. I mean, I don't want a luxury apartment in the CBD. I just want a place to call mine. I would feel safe. I would feel secure. I would be, I would feel like I had a future because I wouldn't have to worry about what would happen in 20 years time if, you know, I had a house. But as prices soar, she's had to accept she may never buy a home. I, I did everything right. I did everything that every politician has ever told us to do. You know, we were told growing up that, you know, the Australian dream, owning your own house, all you have to do to get that is you go to school, go to college, go to university, get a good job, and boom, Bob's your uncle, you'll be able to get it. But it's just not turned out that way. Even trying to save as hard as you can to get into the market doesn't tend to matter anymore. It's more about who your parents are and, and what kind of wealth they have in their home and, and can help first home buyers with. Only the children of people who already have wealth will be able to acquire home ownership in the, in the future. People who come from poorer backgrounds won't. It's really become a class divide. This is the Butte country, this is the Butte country, this is the Butte country. Just as the English have been called a nation of shopkeepers, so Australians might be called a nation of homeowners. The cost of housing is undermining what was once a defining characteristic of Australian society. Despite the twin penalties of mortgages and lawn mowing, Australians crave a home of their own. Our national monument might well be a suburban cottage on a quarter acre block, for this is what most Australians spend their lives working to pay off. How important is it to a woman to have a home of her own? Oh, very important. It's a wonderful feeling to have your own home. I think it'd be terrible not to have your own home. At the end of World War II, only about half of Australian households owned a home. Then government made lifting home ownership a national priority. Our choice on December the 10th is between a socialist government and a liberal government. Prime Minister Menzies saw it as a bulwark against communism, applauding the instinct to have a little piece of earth with a house and garden to call our own. The Liberal Party believes that every worthwhile Australian wants to own his own home. In the Menzies era, they started out by making loans available from the Commonwealth to the states which built housing for returning soldiers and various other lower income households to get into home purchase. And the home ownership rate rose by about 20 percentage points from 52% at the 1947 census to a peak of 72% at the census of 1966. And the reason why we were able to achieve such an extraordinary increase in home ownership was because Governments focused on boosting the supply of housing and didn't do anything beyond running a high immigration program to inflate the demand for housing. In particular, governments built quite a lot of houses themselves, either for rent to people on low incomes or after the election of the Menzies government for sale to people who had modest incomes but not quite high enough to qualify for loans from the private savings banks. I think in many ways that was a sort of golden era in which Australia was seen as a place that for people living here or moving here, migrating here, it was actually a realistic possibility to work hard, save money, buy a piece of land and build a house. It was actually attainable for, for most people. So housing was actually a method of attaining equality in that era. No longer. These days, you can't escape the headlines about crazy house prices. 
wages can't possibly keep up. It's creating a kind of mania where people think, if I don't buy now, I'll never be able to. What's important over this period is the sentiment, is the worry of missing out, is the fear of missing out, is the panic buying behaviour. Professor of Economics Xu Ping Chu calls it housing fever. They probably want a house in the near future, but they worry that in the near future the price will go up so much that they won't be able to, apply, uh, to afford it. Therefore, they decided to purchase now. So you get a diabolical situation where people jump in for fear of missing out and that pushes up prices even further. That's exactly the self-excitation process that we're seeing at the moment in the market. We hear all the exciting stories that's going on in the market and the media report about um, how house price auction results exceed owner's expectation and those reinforce the expectation of the market and attracted more and more people to go into the market. With a colleague at Yale University, she's devised an economic model to take the temperature of housing markets. Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane are running hot. Brisbane and South East Queensland are extremely popular markets at the moment, largely because people are wanting somewhere uh, safe to live as we come out of the pandemic. Due to limited supply in those markets, property prices are just going up and up and up. Folks, a very good afternoon. We'll get this afternoon's auction underway. One million two hundred eighty-six thousand dollars and playing for ownership. One million three hundred thousand dollars. Anything further? Shake of the head. Might be good news for you, sir. So we sell. Welcome home, we are sold to you at $1,300,000. Went hard, yeah. Thought we had a good crack, but not enough in this market, really. It's been insane, yeah. honestly. It's been insane, but you can only do what you can do. The one next door sold 120 yeah. grand less, and it's a five, five bedroom, bedroom compared to this three bedroom, so market's going up. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. <Brian. laughs> It is definitely the hottest I've ever seen with the low supply, the high demand, the lower interest rates and the cost of borrowing money being so cheap. In Melbourne, we've just come out of a period where buyers were not able to actually inspect a property. Private property inspections were not allowed, let alone public property inspections. Despite these restrictions, the market has continued to rise. Uh, which I find very surprising indeed. Not too many people like to go and purchase a property worth hundreds of thousands of dollars without actually inspecting it and seeing it. Now that buyers can access properties, that has now really opened up the marketplace once again and uh, the, the buyer interest is, is stronger than we've ever seen. Buyers, the ball is in your court. How much would you like to pay? We have a seller who wants to sell. So put your bids up on the chat. For nearly 40 minutes, people with their hearts set on this Melbourne home nudge the price higher and higher. At 1,700,000, we are selling and playing for keeps. 1,715,000, Virginia. Final call at 1,759, about to go. Going twice, third and final call. This is a absolute marathon of an auction, ladies and gentlemen. 791 is the price. Virginia, hammers up. In the absence, I will sell. <coughs> Sold at $1,791,000. Virginia, you have succeeded. What an amazing auction. Tony that was um, amazing competition, gruelling and tiring. Uh, and I'm, I'm done, just ferocious bidding that we're seeing on property at the moment. Yeah, crazy. Sydney, for example, to get into the market right now, you would have to be earning close to at least $100,000 per annum. It's proving very difficult for those who are on uh, below the average income. Well, Sydney is obviously the least affordable city in Australia at the moment, requiring something like 44% of, of average income to service a loan. At that middle income level, only 30% of dwellings are comfortably affordable for households. 
It's even more staggering when you look at low income earners. People who are on lower incomes can only afford about 1.9% of properties across Sydney. Rob Stanley works as a buyer's agent in Sydney's eastern suburbs. Today, he's off to meet some clients and look at a three-bedroom semi. It's up the hill from the beaches in a back street of Bondi. Been being basically being buyer's agent for the last 15 years, and there's been some ways, but the last two years have just been, I use the word incredible, that I just don't believe how much prices have jumped. And these prices that have been seen recently are far exceeding what I think is a fair and reasonable market price, but it is because people are paying it. So that's where the market is now. The last time 8 Bennett Street Bondi changed hands was back in the post-war years. Well, it's an original semi and first time offered since 1953, so 68 years of continuous family ownership. This owner purchased this property for £1,000 or thereabouts, and um, so it's an interesting story from £1,000 all these 68 years later to a guide of $2.2 million. Um, so that's quite an increase over, over those years. What's your daughter's name? Amelia. Hello, Amelia. Rob's clients have a two-year-old and want to upgrade from a unit to a house. Great, thank have you. Have a look through, thank you. They're willing to spend about 2.5 million, leaving aside some money for renovations. That to me is a, a really reasonable budget. So I don't know whether it's just a crazy spike in the market and you know maybe we're looking at the wrong time or whether this is just the way forward, but it seems quite unreasonable that you know looking for an average house that you were looking up to, to spending up to $3 million is just seems it seems quite bizarre. The unrenovated home is a window on how much housing costs have soared. On auction day, Rob's clients had no luck. We were expecting uh, five or six registered bidders, but it turned to be 17. We were expecting the magic numbers like 2.5 to buy it. That's what we heard to the agent. We started the auction off at, um, at 2.4, 2.5, 2.6. Um, and actually hit 2712. So we were, weren't surprised. Uh, clients were slightly disappointed, but with that much interest, it just, it, just, it just kept going, it just kept going. And as I said, the fear of missing out was there. Had this $2.7 million plus property merely tracked the inflation rate over the past 68 years, it would be worth about $37,000. What do you think is causing this? I mean, the big one would be low interest rates. Um, the, the lower the cost of debt, the more people are incentivised to, to borrow and buy. So that's put a lot of additional pressure on the housing market. Old houses are full of stories. In another semi, we find a little piece of history. When they pulled up the flooring in this room, they found a bunch of old newspapers and have a look at this one. Have a read of that headline. This is the Sunday Telegraph from August 11, 1963. It's extraordinary to think that all the way back then, the headlines were about young people being frozen out of the housing market. But the issue then wasn't high prices. It was strict lending standards. Banks were very conservative about how much people could borrow. This will leave you uh, approximately £950, which you haven't got, and is uh, commonly known these days as the deposit gap. To buy most consumer goods on long-term repayment requires very little, if any, deposit. But to buy a house, the purchaser needs up to a third of the total price. Yes, well, this is what I'm interested in, a kitchen. You need a big kitchen. We had an issue of rationing of credit, perhaps too much rationing of credit at that time. But after the deregulation of the financial sector, lending really opened up. No doubt, when we consider the past 30 years, the deregulation of the financial sector has been one of the key drivers behind the rise in dwelling prices over that period of time. 
Generous tax concessions for property investors, including the halving of the capital gains tax under the Howard government, have also played a part. And what, of course, that's done has been to put investors in competition with would-be home buyers for what's a limited supply of housing. People who might otherwise have been able to buy can't afford to do so in competition with investors who get their interest costs subsidised by other taxpayers through negative gearing and who pay less tax on the capital gains they ultimately intend to make than the tax people pay on their wage and salary income. Labor took a policy to wind back these tax concessions to the last two federal elections and lost. Now it's dropped the plan. We were extremely disappointed in Labor for doing that. We don't think that you can do anything meaningful about rebalancing home ownership in Australia without addressing those tax settings. To compete against investors and break into the market, First home buyers are having to take on eye-watering debts. You see a listing that you like and you start imagining, you know, what it would be like to live there or start imagining you living in that particular suburb or where you would put up certain furniture and, you know, you go from there and perhaps sooner or rather than later you realise that, um, you know, the price guide is way beyond um, what, what you initially hoped it would be. Pat Luang Sang Thong is looking for a one bedroom flat within reasonable distance of her work in Sydney. Um, so we can only have one in, yeah. through at a time. I as go well. in first and cool. then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. check in here. Right. Yeah. Do you think it's going to be in your price range? Probably on the edge of. Her family are stumping up half the deposit. But she's still going to have to borrow so much that beyond basic needs, there won't be much left for anything else. With the maximum borrowing power um, and current interest rates, you know, I'm looking at 40 to 50 per cent repayment, um, which would be really difficult. Um, 40 to 50 per cent of your income? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, that's taking into account the current interest rates. So if that goes up, um, it, I'm going to be put in a really difficult position. It wouldn't take much of an increase in interest rates to put some people in real trouble. I think it's a huge concern, um, and it's a concern not just for individuals, but for the economy. Fearing soaring housing debt could destabilise the economy, regulators have intervened. Banks must now ensure borrowers have a bigger buffer against rate rises. But that won't help first home buyers. Ultimately, what they intend to do is to make it harder to take out a loan, uh, given your level of income that you're earning right now. It's going to stop as many people overextending themselves, but it also means that people on lower incomes, first home buyers, won't be able to borrow quite as much and may uh, stop some people from getting into the housing market. For decades, both sides of politics have responded to concerns about affordability by offering grants and subsidies to first home buyers, a strategy embraced by the Morrison government. Yet the coalition MP chairing Parliament's latest housing affordability inquiry concedes such measures often make things worse. We have tried to fix the problem over time by stimulating demand, by tipping uh, the scales in favour of first home buyers. And what that has ultimately resulted in is that we have forced up prices in the major markets. So the beneficiary has not been the home buyer, it's actually been the home seller. And on every occasion during the past 30 years when it seemed as though house prices might fall, governments have intervened by providing ever larger grants to would-be first home buyers on ever more generous eligibility criteria and the Reserve Bank has cut interest rates to in every cycle new record lows and the result of those steps has been to reignite the property price fire on every occasion when it's looked like going out. The heat in the market extends to regional areas, 
especially the coast. Beautiful beaches, a stunning natural environment and a warm climate have made Noosa and the Sunshine Coast a mecca for holiday makers. The area has become a magnet for people no longer tied to city offices. As people have found that they can work from home and their employers allow them to work from home, it's become a very viable option to move to a coastal region, not necessarily Noosa, bring your children with you, have them enjoy the lifestyle that maybe you grew up with, and you know, happy days. And I think you know, some national advertising is really important for this one, yeah. so maybe... Tom Offerman and his daughter Rebecca work in a tightly held market that's been deluged by buyers. I started in real estate in the mid 80s and if someone had told me where prices would be today, I, I would have laughed. I think everyone would have. And we've been through some very strong cycles before and I think this is unprecedented. This is the, uh, the strongest market that I've experienced in over 30 years. So can you tell me a bit about what you're looking for and then I'll see what I have that might suit. I guess it's this period where people have had time to really reconsider where they want to be and Noosa is coming to the top of the list for a lot of people. My role in Sydney was already working remotely, so being able to move to Noosa was actually quite an easy transition. For James and Meg, finding a house was far from easy. We were going to open houses and they'd already been sold to sight unseen from Melbourne or sight unseen from Sydney. We looked at one property that I inquired on. Uh, it had come on the market that day and by the time I'd made the inquiry that afternoon, it had already gone under contract. So things have been going same day. At the Pelicans. They tried to rent while they were looking to buy. That was even harder. There's also a huge shortage of rental properties up here. So even trying to rent a place for a while while the market cooled, that wasn't really an option either. The prices of rent and the fact you might need to give six months rent in advance just to get um, a look in on a property, uh, that's very hard for people when they don't have that much of a cash reserve if they're young and just starting out. What was the bingo? Was it numbers or was she it words? In the end, the Summertons found their Noosa home and have no regrets. Have you got your math test back? I have not, no. no next term. Next term? Yeah, and they did it yesterday, so there'd be some speed well, marking. Speak, <laughs> speak, well, surely they know the answers. Yeah. It's been great. It's been really good financially. We managed to reduce our mortgage significantly by taking the sale price from our house in Sydney and converting that up here. So you get quite, your money goes quite a long way. Since the onset of COVID, there's been a significant reversal of the long-standing population flows from regional centres to cities. Instead, people are moving in the other direction. And that's the main reason why, since the onset of COVID, property prices in regional areas have risen at a faster rate than in the capital cities, and rents even more so. It's meant that higher income people are moving into regions which have traditionally been occupied by lower income people and those lower income people get displaced and that's happening in rental markets, in ownership markets all over Australia. We're seeing it as a really noticeable effect. Adrian Pazarski is the Executive Officer of National Shelter which advocates for the housing needs of people on low and modest incomes. He also happens to live in Noosa and he's watched the ripple effect from rising house prices extend along the Sunshine Coast. The place that I uh, live in, we purchased about nine years ago, it has nearly tripled in value over that period of time. People on the Sunshine Coast and right throughout regional Australia and also in our capital cities are just priced out of the market. So more and more people are therefore reliant on rental housing and that puts more pressure on the rental market and it means that ultimately uh, there's going to be more homelessness at the end of the day.
Parliament's latest housing affordability inquiry is putting the emphasis on boosting supply. What do you think is at the root of the problem? I think the root of the problem is that we haven't allowed people to build enough houses uh, for those who want to buy it. Both zoning and the application of zoning and whatever else is going on in the marketplace has meant that you don't have as much housing getting built as you have demand for housing. It's not quite that simple. Economist Cameron Murray has studied the financial accounts and annual reports of the big property developers, which show that they limit the supply of new land and homes to maximise prices and profits. I don't see that private land and property markets have any incentives anywhere in the system to rapidly supply housing and depress the price. He's also crunched the numbers on claims we can build our way out of the affordability problem. So if we doubled construction, hypothetically, for 10 years, we're talking about a 10 to 15% price reduction. And we've seen prices rise by more than that in the past nine months. So you can see the futility in many ways of trying to tackle prices through the supply side. It's going to take a number of uh, solutions to resolve it, and we're not going to solve it over the short term, in my view. We'll have to make reform in taxation, we'll have to make reform in housing supply, we'll have to make reform in terms of housing credit, we'll have to make some big decisions in terms of what we wish to do with Big Australia, because there's no doubt about it, when you have a booming population, that can hurt affordability as well. Whether politicians will have the will to tackle affordability is another question. When millions of Australians accumulate so much wealth by doing nothing other than owning real estate. The attitude we have to housing, not just investors and landlords, but every homeowner in Australia is really, uh, it's about speculation at the end of the day. And you'll hear it at barbecues about people's homes being an investment. The stock of Australian dwellings is worth $9 trillion. And if you create interventions that reduce the value, you are wiping trillions of dollars of value off the balance sheets of Australian homeowners. Now, I don't see any political appetite for that. Politicians shed crocodile tears for the difficulties faced by young, aspiring home buyers. There's an awful lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth by politicians of all political persuasions as to how difficult that's become. Yet politicians keep doing the same things. You know, it kind of reminds you of Einstein's definition of madness, that's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting that this time you'll get a different result. I think there's been a shift in the Australian psyche where because so much wealth is generated from housing over time, housing has become, rather than a place of security where you raise a family, something that you seek to create wealth from and speculate on. So that's a really big shift over the last 40 years and, and it's really one that uh, I don't think will serve the future well. Unless things change, Australia is on course to become a more unequal society, with a growing gulf between the wealth and the lives of those who own homes and those who never will. Maybe we're only really talking about housing affordability or being concerned with housing affordability when it starts to affect middle to higher income, first home buyers. And we're not really looking at the long term and saying, what do we do to stop that bigger divergence in home ownership rates between low-income households and high-income households? The situation's left me feeling completely defeated, you know, like there's no point, you're not rich enough, you know, and we're just going to keep letting the prices rise and rise and rise and, you know, you're just going to have to put up with it.